So zillions of people are doing blockchains. Cardano is the blockchain product of IOHK. It's got lots of important features that some others lack, such as being proof of stake rather than proof of work. And ever since uh, Ethereum, one thing people look for in a blockchain is smart contracts. Plutus is the smart contract language for the Cardano blockchain. Uh, the oldest one of these is Ethereum. It's got some great ideas in it, but also uh, it regularly loses tens of millions of US dollars. And some of this is because of something that a programming language person like me coming in would look at and go, no, 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 no that's poor language design. For instance, one of the things that caused a lot of problems is it doesn't catch integer overflow. If you have a 256-bit word and they're all ones and you add one to it, it goes to all zero. So all the money has gone away. And um, scams have cost literally tens of millions of dollars taking advantage of that. So if you're a programming language person like me, you go, no, don't do that. But there are other things that we don't really understand yet. So we know a lot about how to build reliable systems. And um, one thing I believe helps a lot is building on a functional language. So Plutus is built as a functional language, which is quite different from many, not all of them, out there. Um, Plutus is built on Haskell, which we have uh, 30 years of experience with now. And so we believe we can do something like lots of um, financial institutions use Haskell because they can write programs for analyzing the financial markets much more quickly and reliably. So banks are making heavy use of this it makes sense to apply this technology to the blockchain. Um, we know a lot about applying formal methods to functional languages, which should let us start to say, okay, you put this in this environment, look at all possible attacks, let's prove that no attack under a given model can work. So we're in a position to start to do that sort of thing. I would love to say, yes, we, we've got that all down pat. We know how to do it perfectly. We don't. It's still a research issue. It's a research issue for the whole community. But a lot of the community is trying to figure out how do we make um, the EVM reliable. We're a step up from that. We're starting from something that's already much more reliable. There's still really interesting questions about how do you improve the reliability even more. But at least we're starting from a step up. There are different kinds of power of programming languages. Some programming languages are very limited. Some programming languages can do anything a computer can do. The technical name for this is being Turing complete. So whatever a computer can do, any programming language that's Turing complete can do that. Plutus is a Turing complete language. Uh, very often, that's more power than you need. Um, so very often what you want to use is what's called a domain specific language something that's designed to make it easy to talk about things in a particular domain, say writing down financial contracts. And what you trade off for that is you can't do everything. But what you gain from that is very often you can do analysis in there. So there's actually been a lot of work, particularly in the functional programming area. So it all goes back to a paper by Simon Peyton Jones, working with a couple of co-authors, that came up with a very simple model of financial contracts. I know it very well because I was the chair of the conference in which it was presented. I had just introduced a new category of something called pearls, which were supposed to be, um, this isn't new research, this is a nice application of, of things we already know. And he presented it as that. It was one of the first uh, pearls presented in the International Conference for Functional Programming. So that became highly influential. And one of the nice analyses you could do is you'd write out a contract and the value of the contract might depend on different things, right? Like what the price of sugar is this week. Um, but you could analyze it for an expected value based on the range of values that sugar might take on. So doing that kind of analysis for a general purpose program is very difficult. But there are straightforward techniques that could be applied to value a contract written in this special purpose language. A lot of work has happened along with this. It's been pointed out that if you took the various very obscure contracts that led to the subprime crisis, program them up in this way and analyze them, there might have been a lot less of an issue. 
Unfortunately, just like you haven't had as much regulation of the banks as there should have been after that, there hasn't been as much take up of these ideas as there should be after that. But the ideas have been developed. You can use them for valuing things. You can use them for writing things out. And the nice thing is you don't need a programmer to do this. So IOTK is not the only group to be um, following this. We spoke recently with Fritz Henglein and a group he's been working with called Dion Digital. They've coded up very similar contracts, also a descendant of Peyton Jones' original work. And um, they've discovered something really important, which is that you don't need programmers to do this. They have their people talk to what are called financial engineers, and the financial engineers can then take over the maintenance of these contracts. So you don't need a full-time developer. You can get somebody who's more familiar with the business angle to actually write out what they want, and they can look at it and see that it does what they want. So this kind of language is quite valuable, and Marlowe is our contribution in this space. It's basically using the same ideas, but then you need to do things to adapt them to the blockchain. So I mentioned, oh, your contract might depend on the price of sugar. Right, how do you find out what the price of sugar is if you're on a blockchain? The name for that is an oracle, but there's several different ways of doing that, and then we need to be able to hook into those. Marlowe's being developed, taking these ideas forward and adapting them to the Cardano blockchain. And I think it's a great idea because much as I love the full power of programming languages, you don't always need that. So if you can go with a more simple domain-specific language, that's the thing you want to do. It's very interesting that all these different pieces of work end up saying, oh yeah, we, we've got about the same components here. Computers aren't that old, and programming computers is not that old a thing, right? The first stored program computers were developed towards the end of World War II. Very interestingly, the models of computation were developed just a bit before that, in the 1930s. Uh, the people who did this were um, Alan Turing. Just before that, actually, the same thing, had um, a different model, but equivalent, had been done by Alonzo Church, and that was the first functional programming language, something called the Lambda Calculus. So one of the things I really like about the Lambda Calculus is that it's older than computers. So it goes back to the 1930s, and uh, another nice thing about it is Church did this in 1932. Uh, a different logician, Gerhard Gensen, uh, was looking at formulations of symbolic logic. And even though symbolic logic has been around 2,000 years since the ancient Greeks, the formulation that we use today was invented in 1935 by Gerhard Gensen. Uh, the first formal systems were like Boole in the 1850s. The, one that, the formal system that we use is due to Gensen in 1935, and only in 1969 did somebody work out, wait a minute, what Church did in 1932 and what Gensen did in 1935, those are actually the same thing but it took about 50 years for people to see that. So the fact that the same thing happened independently twice, for me, is just really exciting. It suggests that this is not completely arbitrary. If you look at a language like Java or JavaScript, there is just so much in it that is completely arbitrary. Lambda calculus is very tiny, and there's nothing in it that's arbitrary, and evidence of that is it was discovered by two people independently. Um, so for me, that's just a very exciting idea, and that's why I find functional programming so exciting, is it's not arbitrary. Um, and the more we look into it, the more powerful it seems to be. Uh, when we started Haskell, uh, there were lots of different functional languages around. There were a number of us exploring the same techniques, so there are two big families called strict and lazy. And we were wor working in the lazy family, and there were about half a dozen close to a dozen different research groups, all doing their own thing. And Paul Hudak said, wouldn't it be better if we were all working together? So all these groups came together and we standardized uh, a language which we called Haskell. Um, there were four different editors of the Haskell report. Paul Hudak was one, I was one, John Hughes was one, Simon Peyton Jones, who I mentioned already, was one and then a much larger group of people who contributed ideas. So it's been extremely productive. Uh, so we just came together and said, all right, let's um, 
let's just try to consolidate so that we can all work together. And that was amazingly successful. Not a, f a few people went off to the side and did their own thing, but by and large, people working in this corner of the field um, have been using Haskell. It's been amazingly successful in academic terms. And then the interesting thing is you just keep doing something for 30 years and then you find it's not just academics using it, right? Over those 30 years, we've taught a lot of students. A lot of them have gone out into the world. And a lot of them have said, no, I actually want to use this to get real things done. Uh, and as I've mentioned, it's very heavily used in banking now. Uh, it's being picked up by IOHK and by some other cryptocurrency firms as a way of building cryptocurrency software that has high assurance, but that you can still build quickly. There are a few different avenues, such as the banks, by which it may get out there. And I think cryptocurrency might be, as it were, the killer app that brings us much more into the mainstream. So I was talking about how Church and Genson both came up with exactly the same idea. Uh, the interesting thing is this doesn't just happen once. It's now happened time and time and time again. One place where it happened was the logician Jean-Yves Girard and the computer scientist John Reynolds both came up with the next logical extension of lambda calculus, which is what you would want to do if you have a typed language. If you have a typed language, the most important thing is to be able to parameterize over the types. So you say you've got a sorting routine, it takes a list of things for which you have some uh, ordering relation and it sorts the list. Okay, it's a list of what? Okay, you want to parameterize over what it's a list of. So you could do list of integers or list of strings or list of list of strings or what have you. Um, so that's called the polymorphic lambda calculus. That's what Reynolds called it. It's also called system F. It's a very simple system, just like lambda calculus. And that's what we use for Plutus core. It's nothing else. It's exactly this system that was discovered independently by two different people. And that goes back, um, Gerard wrote his work in 1972, Reynolds in 1974. That's 45 years old now. This gives us some real sense that when we're putting something on the blockchain, we're not going to need to take it off into a hard fork or something just a few months or a year down the line. This system's been around for 45 years and we can use exactly that for what we're doing. So that gives me some assurance that's going to work further down the line. When we wrote, first wrote the Haskell report, we said we want this to be usable in education and in industry. But hey, it started out mainly being used for education and in academia. But as I said, as you do this, your students go off and they start actually doing things with it. So it used to be I would only speak at academic conferences, but over the last decade or so, I find myself more and more often being invited to come and talk to developer conferences. And for me, this is really exciting to see this huge community of people that are interested in functional languages, that have picked it up and have done amazing things with it. The technical world goes back to the Renaissance, but we've only had computing around for less than 100 years. It's very exciting to see this begin to move out into the world and to see what people do with it. Right, right now, very few people get trained in programming languages, but everybody's going to be. So it's exciting to see this move out into the world, to see these new communities building up. And IOHK is doing a great job of contributing to these communities. They're running a number of schools. I've already had the opportunity to speak at one of the schools they ran uh, in Barbados, training up a new generation of people. They're about to do another one in Ethiopia, training up a new generation of people. It's great to see the community building large, in the large round functional programming, but also the specific community that IOHK is helping to build. And these two will interact in great ways. So IOHK is a very good citizen of this community. It contributes a lot to try to keep um, Haskell uh, as a growing development to um, make it easier for various people to use. And that's both on the technical development side and on the training side. So IOHK is gonna be um, part of carrying all this forward.